Good morning and welcome to worship here at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Rachel DeBoss Hagler and I am so glad that you're here today choosing to step out of the busyness and into worship, to be with us, to read scripture and sing song and to feel God's presence among us. Wherever you are worshiping this morning, we are so glad you're here. Welcome to worship. Good morning, St. Paul's. Please join me in the call to worship. Called by Jesus Christ to love, we gather as one. Blessed by God's wisdom, we gather to learn. Amazed by the movement of the Holy Spirit, we gather to worship. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join me in the unison prayer. God of glory and might, speak to us with your wisdom, that we might truly hear you. Display your majesty, that we might truly see you. Transform the chaos of our lives with the clarity of your call, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. Amen. Passing the peace of Christ is something that we are called to do as Christians. Christ dwells within us. His peace, his love, his mercy, kindness, compassion, his whole self dwells within us, and we ought to be sharing that with everyone. So this week, take that love and peace and kindness and compassion and share it with neighbors and strangers. Share it with people who you love and people who you do not yet know. It is a good and holy thing to pass the peace of Christ. And so this day and for the rest of this week, may the peace of Christ be with you. We're moving right into ministry moments, and there are quite a few things that I'm going to be announcing here. So if you're a calendar person, grab your calendars and your pens. We're going to jot down some times and dates, for we have a lot going on leading up to Easter. But first, we have our weekly uh, Sunday schools for adults at 9 a.m. on Sunday mornings virtually and for middle and high schoolers at 11 a.m. virtually as well. Beginning next week on the 21st, adult Sunday school will be working through a 12-week study on the book of James. If you're interested in joining, please let me know. There are materials that I will have to get to you, but all are welcome. 
On Wednesday at 6.30, this upcoming, and on the 24th, there are services that are collaboration with our Venter and Oxnard churches. It's called the Lenten Caravan. It is all virtual, and a different pastor each week leads the service, and so all are welcome, and please come and join us. Come and pray and sing with us, and I look forward to seeing you there. We then move into Holy Week, and on... April 1st, it is Monday, Thursday. We are planning not a typical service, but something of a walkthrough of prayer stations here on campus. More details will come, but we will be having a station for communion, and there will be a few other stations of tangible faith. And it has been a long time since we have had anything on campus. And we are going to be doing this safely. We will be requiring masks, and there will be a lot more information coming out in the next few weeks about what that will look like. But we wanted you to know that on April 1st, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, at 5.30, between 5.30 and 6.30, we will be having a walk through opportunity to be centered for Holy Week in preparation for Easter. More information to come on Monday, Thursday, but mark your calendars because we're really looking forward to this opportunity for prayer and connection. Good Friday is a virtual service that will be being put on by the Lenten Caravan. Our brother over at Bethel AME Church will be leading us in that service. It'll be at 6.30 virtually on Good Friday. We will also be meeting virtually on Easter Sunday. Can you believe it's Easter coming up so quickly? At 1015, we will have our traditional service. It's going to be different and beautiful music and lots and lots of flowers and wonderful things because it is Easter, one of our favorite, if not our favorite, holiday as Christians. And during that day, since we cannot be in person, which is just part of our reality, and it's very, very sad that we can't be together in person, we will be having the cross out in the parking lot throughout the day for you to come and place a flower. More information will come out about this, but there will be a tangible act to see the cross bloom into the resurrection and bloom into life. So if you have flowers from your garden, if you have flowers that you love, be sure to bring them on Easter Sunday. More information about that will come and more about the time and all of that, but it will be kind of throughout the whole day that you can come and put flowers on the cross. I know that was a lot, but we have a lot going on and we're trying to make it as meaningful as possible as we work through this Lenten season gearing up for Easter. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to comment below and please do not hesitate to contact our church. More information will roll out as the weeks come closer, but know that you are welcome to everything that we're providing. We look forward to seeing you at all of these events. Our first scripture reading comes from the book of Psalm, chapter 19, verses 7 through 14. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from their hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Oh, gracious God, open our ears and open our hearts to receive you. This Lenten journey is long, but we know that at the end of it, we receive the hope, we witness the light, and the resurrection lifts us up. For you are good and you are holy this day and every day. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. We are halfway through the season of Lent, this 40-day season of Lent. Last week, I talked about how it feels like it truly honestly feels like we've been in a year long Lent because we are coming up now on the year mark of not being able to meet in person. It is, it's just really incredible and really difficult to process through that. But here we are finding ourselves here once again in the Lenten season, unable to meet, but we're halfway through the 40 day wilderness. We're halfway through the journey that leads us to the cross, halfway through the journey that leads us to the resurrection. And halfway through this journey, we are now looking at a text that is really striking, I think is a good word. It, it has us encounter a side of Jesus that I don't think we're all very comfortable with or that many of us are perhaps not comfortable with. We're encountering a side of Jesus that is really seldom seen in full force or at least written down in the Bible in full force. We are witnessing Jesus entering the temple where God is presumed to be dwelling and to be worshipped there. He enters into the temple. He observes his surroundings. And he is frustrated. He is upset. He is righteously angry of what he sees going on. This place where it's supposed to be sacred and it's supposed to be a religious setting where people can worship God is not supplying that kind of space. He sees this place, the temple, the deemed sacred space, it's riddled with cattle and sheep, which are meant for sacrificial rituals. But still, it's riddled with people who are exchanging money. It's riddled with people who are not exchanging words of love and kindness. It's riddled with busyness. He walks in and says, my friends, this is not how this space ought to be used. Not in my father's house. This does not belong here. And perhaps he could have gone in and said it that way. Friends, this is not what we should be doing. This is not my father's house. We need to get rid of all these extra things and move on with our lives. That would be what I would imagine how I typically hear Jesus in my head, what I could imagine him doing. But that is not the Jesus we encounter this time around. He shatters every time I read this text, shatters my expectations because I want him to sound like that, calm in the storm, a peaceful presence, but he's not. He's outwardly frustrated. He's outwardly upset with this religious space being filled with stuff that aren't 
God. It's a place for selling animals and not a place for prayer. And the busyness of this religious-oriented space has turned into a marketplace. Jesus has some big feelings about that. Big feelings, so big that he just can't contain it. And he goes off, he makes a whip out of cords, he comes on in, pours all the money out, dumps all the change everywhere, and he takes the table and he flips it. I imagined actually having a table here and flipping it, but I don't have a table I could do that with because imagine him doing that. The amount of effort, the frustration that that does exude, how loud that would be, the chaotic scene that he would be making. I mean, the physical act of doing all of those things would draw attention. He's drawing this attention and outwardly showing his frustration. He makes it explicitly clear that he is not happy with what is going on. I do like this text because of its striking nature. I do like that Jesus is feeling these big feelings. In seminary, the schooling that I went to for graduate school, where we learn about Jesus, we learn how to be pastors, we all learn how to do religious-oriented work, we use this text a lot. We mentioned it in passing and in casual conversations over lunch because this text so perfectly describes how we felt majority of the time as we dug deeper and deeper into the church world. We spent all these years in grad school developing tools and ways to develop ministries and have fruitful spaces of church. We spent years studying how to be proficient pastors and religious workers to create conversational spaces and safe spaces. We were seeking how to do good and institutionalize religion. We had these expectations that we would step into the ministry world, we'd be accepted with open arms, and that these new fun ideas for our ministry would just work. But that is not the reality. And so we were always really frustrated with the way that the system was created and the way that the system always felt like it was dropping the ball. We had expectations and then they weren't being met. And so we had a lot of big feelings about it. And this text, why we always talked about this text is because it validated our feelings. It validated that we were frustrated with injustice, that we are frustrated with disappointing actions of church leaders. Now I'm an ordained person in an institutionalized religion. It is still frustrating sometimes. I still find myself hitting roadblocks and feeling upset and what I like to think is righteously angry righteously angry, excuse me, when people are abusing the title of what it means to be a Christian, when people are not preaching love and acceptance and hope, but rather judgment and hellfire, I continue to feel like I want to make whips out of cords and that I want to dump the coins out and that I want to flip tables because there's a lot of work that we do as people of faith, as churches, as as ordained people, as disciples of Christ, and every one step forward feels like there's another two steps back in the wider Christian community. I'm upset that the busyness of this world oftentimes takes priority over learning how to deepen our relationship with God. I feel big feelings. I feel like there needs to be more space to feel them. And this text, I believe, is so striking because A, Jesus is feeling the feelings, but B, he's also able to express it and we can rest easy in that. We ought to be holding each other accountable in this, accountable in this church, in this not just St. Paul's, but in the church. Christianity is a very flawed construct. 
because we don't follow Christ's footsteps all the time. Religious institutions have a long way to go to catch up with the wonders that Jesus accomplishes. But we can start here in this space. We take this text full of big feelings, frustration, anger, the feeling of being upset or disappointed, Frustration that the church is still a place of corruption. The, the anger that Jesus is not always at the core of Christian message. Disappointment that oppression still occurs in the walls of the church. We can feel so angry that people are marginalized. That Christians marginalize people of color, people of low economic status, people who define in the LGBTQIA community, people who are othered. These are feelings that we can feel, and they are just, and they are honest, and they are righteous. When injustice is happening and we don't feel the big feelings, that is when I think we should be asking, why not? This text gives us permission to follow Jesus' footsteps and feel upset that not everybody is treated equally, to feel angry that places of worship are dismantled because of things like a marketplace. Now, with that, we must be careful because we don't want to take this text and have it become obliterated and have it become something that it's not. It's not saying go out and be violent. It's not saying go out and flip any table that you want to. It's not saying to go out and be a disruption or cause harm. It is not saying any of those things. It's not giving permission to do harmful acts to others. It's rooted in a sense of accountability. Jesus didn't pick a random place to flip a table. He was angry that people were prioritizing earthly things over God. He was angry that people were not following this religious-oriented space, the sacredness of it. He wants people to be held accountable. And those that were walking the walk weren't. Who were talking the talk were not walking the walk. Accountability sits at the root of so many things that our church does and does not do well. We have to hold one another accountable before we erupt in flipping tables and pouring corns out and making whips out of cords. Before we get to that point where the feelings are so big we can't hold them in any longer, how do we work through them and address them and speak out of honesty and kindness and love? And not it be something that becomes divisive, but it becomes an opportunity of growth. Jesus disrupts what we think Christianity is, which is only the love that is so easy and the peace that is so resistant to any change. He's saying, I can love you and still hold you accountable. I can love you and still be annoyed that things are not yet to where I expect them. Jesus disrupts the place where people felt was the most sacred, and he's saying that they're not upholding the sacredness. And you know what? I like this side of Jesus. He's shattering the expectations that I think we often place on him, which is that he is the calm, cool, and collective Jesus all the time. But he feels the big feelings, my friends. He is fully divine and fully human, and there is a lot of sense of comfort for me knowing that he feels the big feelings. Perhaps as a new mother, um, I'm feeling a lot of feelings all the time, and they're big, and a lot of them relate to my Three month old, and a lot of them relate to how I envision the church, and a lot of them relate to how can I do the best job guiding and walking with all of you. A lot of them relate to the institution of religion and my frustrations with it. And now, on this side of after giving birth, it is 
so much bigger. But how can we hold ourselves and how can we hold one another accountable with these big feelings and move toward positive action, move toward a positive outcome? Surely the tables can be flipped, but then what? How do we continue to hold one another accountable in love and in compassion and kindness? How do we use it as a growing opportunity and not a divisive space? These are things that we have to work at all the time. But we have, my friends, permission to feel the feelings and be mad at injustice and be angry at, to be angry that things are not God-oriented. So this day, I pray that you think about how to better hold one another and yourself accountable in our actions. I pray that we do not suppress the feelings when we see injustice happening and that we feel them. And I also pray that you know all of this is done in love. We do not act violently or in harm out of hate. We do all of this out of love, knowing that the benefit and the well-being of all people is what matters the most, that the love we pour out comes from our love for Christ. Let us go this day in peace and in righteousness. Let us go in God's name. Amen. We move right into a time for offering. And of course, we want to thank everyone who continues to give with a generous heart. It does not go unnoticed and it matters to this church. It matters for our spiritual disciplines and it makes a difference in the world. So thank you for your faithful giving. On the next slide, you will see there are three ways to give here at St. Paul's through text message, online, and through the mail. We will continue to give thanks for those of generous spirits and generous hearts. If you have any questions about giving to this church or to ministries in our local area, please let us know. Thank you again. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Almighty God, when we set up barriers and prevent others from knowing the truth of your love, forgive us and break down those walls. When we set up barriers in our own minds and lives that keep us away from knowing the truth of your love, forgive us and break down those walls. When we are confused by the calling you have placed upon our hearts, forgive us and break down those walls. Draw us ever closer to you, to one another, and to the beauty of your wisdom and your love. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? O merciful and compassionate God, 
The busyness around us oftentimes bumps us out of the relationship that we seek to build with you, the relationship we seek to deepen with you. We are now a year into virtual worship, a year into not being able to connect with our family here, a year of being separated from our community. Our hearts are weary. The burden feels heavy. And as we journey through this Lenten season toward Easter, we know that the hope exists. But my God, my God, we are tired. We pause, acknowledging this big feeling. This big feeling of weariness. And we breathe you in this day, almighty God, for you swoop us up in your mighty arms and you hold us close for comfort and for strength. There is a lot of things going on in each of our personal lives, family members, friends, neighbors. There are a lot of devastating outcomes of this pandemic. There's a lot that we do not understand that is happening in one another's lives. But we take this moment to lift those burdens up to you. For we know you hear them and you hold them as you do hold us. We give thanks for the opportunity to pray with you, to you, with all of us this day. Be with us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we depart from worship this day, I pray that we go out into the world and halt the busyness and find God in these spaces to hold true to the big feelings that we do feel, that our God also feels. May Jesus shatter our expectations and continue to surprise us. There is a lot that we can do to encounter God this week, and I pray that you encounter God. So go out into the world, go out with your neighbors and all of creation, and go and be love and be Christ in this world. See you next week for worship at 1015 here at St. Paul's. We look forward to it, and may we go in peace. Amen. <laughs>